Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, professor of history at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of The War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. For more than 50 years, the United States Army War College's Eisenhower Series College Program, or ESCP, has been designed to encourage dialogue on national security and other policy issues between War College students and the broader public. In pursuit of dialogue, War College students in the program travel across the country, speaking to college classes, voluntary organizations, think tanks, and other public forums. Here at A Better Peace, we hope to give our listeners a sense of what ESCP students present by giving Eisenhower program participants a chance to share their expertise and insights by offering short versions of their Eisenhower speeches and discussing both their implications and their personal experiences with the program and at the War College in general. Today's podcast is one of a planned series for the class of 2023. Today's topic is NATO. Hailed as perhaps the most successful and longest-lasting military alliance in history, NATO has endured thanks to a high level of trust and cooperation between the United States and more than two dozen European and North American partners. Yet even the most successful alliance of democracies will go through periods of controversy, discord being one of the things that makes democracy unique. As NATO faces its greatest test today with a major war on its doorstep in Ukraine, we welcome two members of the class of 2023 to offer a partner's perspective on the alliance, one from Canada and one from Norway. Colonel Steinar Dahl has 30 years of service in the Norwegian Armed Forces. He has served at every level from rifleman to joint staff. He has multiple deployments to Afghanistan and Iraq and served as the Deputy Chief of Staff of Strategy Plans and Policy for the Norwegian Army before coming to the Army War College this past summer. Born in Montreal, Colonel Eric Landry joined the Canadian Armed Forces in 1994 as an officer in the Armour Branch. He led Army personnel from a reconnaissance troop of 20 soldiers to a mechanized brigade of 4,200 soldiers on international missions to Bosnia, twice to Afghanistan, and in the Middle East. He has also conducted domestic operations from sovereignty patrols in the Arctic to flood relief in southern Quebec. He holds an MBA and a master's in defense studies in addition to his studies here at the War College. He and his wife are the parents of three teenagers, which may, of course, be the most difficult leadership challenge he has faced. He enjoys running and loves fishing, downhill skiing, and obviously, because it's the law, ice hockey. So (laughs) I also have to confess that Eric Langer is also a student in my particular seminar at the U.S. Army War College in the class of 2023, so he will not hold against me the number of Canadian jokes that I have made and will make in the course of this conversation. Anyway, welcome, Eric. Welcome, Steinar, to A Better Peace. Thank you, Ron. So I want to give you each a chance to offer a uh, a shortened version of the speech that you would normally give uh, for the audiences that you've uh, been in front of as a Eisenhower student. And we we drew lots beforehand backstage. um, And Eric won. So he gets to go first. Eric, please. Thanks, Ron. Um, you, you mentioned the, the controversy and, you know, uh, you might remember that in 2019, French President Emmanuel Macron actually described NATO as being brain dead. Uh, you go three years later, the war in Ukraine started and then uh, a lot of people's attitude changed. I was, um, I was always convinced that uh, NATO was relevant and that Canada was a, a, a big part of NATO. Um, but I quickly realized that uh, the war in Ukraine sparked a debate about every member's contribution and um, the reason why some countries might not be um, contributing their fair share. Um, you know, as a Canadian, uh, you know, my country is, has been a, a founding uh, member of, of the alliance. I've always thought that 
you know, Canada was was uh, not only contributing its fair share, but p- punching well above its weight. You know, like one of those five eight players in the NHL. <laughs> the uh, <clears throat> the the alliance measures contribution on on various levels, but the the main metric that people are familiar with is the 2% of the gross domestic product. Um, So I looked at this because Canada was at the center of the critiques because my country, although uh, one of the largest economies in the world, is far from reaching that that target. So um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is essentially why Canada is a useful member of of NATO. I'm going to talk about this metric. I'm going to talk about uh, the capability that capabilities that uh, Canada actually brings to NATO. And um, lastly, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, th- those, cr- those, those critiques and why I think they're not really justified. So um, first, let's talk about the Alliance. So founded in, in 1949, originally, originally 12 members, uh, grew now to 31 uh, eventually, uh, 32 when um, when uh, Sweden joins, every member brings something different to the alliance. Um, and you know, uh, I'm going to make another hockey reference, but just like on a, on a hockey team, every member of the team has different level of skills. They don't uh, practice the same way. They don't play the same way on the ice. Uh, they're not paid the same. However, they always uh, aim to the same goal. You know, they contribute to the same goal, to the level of their talent, to the level of their capabilities. So to measure uh, a country's contribution in terms of input, to me, is a mistake. Because what you're when you're measuring inputs, so a percentage of GDP, you're not measuring an output or an outcome. So there's there's it's it's only a a valid metric in the terms that it shows the government's willingness to impose a tax on its own people for their own protection it's a measure of interest more than really an outcome and for a country like canada where our economy is very ba- is based much on on resources, natural resources. If the price of oil tanks, for example, and uh, we maintain the same uh, spendings on defense, then you know our percent of GDP will increase. So it's an imperfect metric. It's it's useful for comparison. It's referred to most importantly, uh, I think, because people can relate to it and people can understand it. But it's very imperfect, and and I think uh, we shouldn't use that sole metric to judge uh, any country's contribution. Because what does Canada bring to the fight? Well, you know, we've we've participated in every major NATO mission. We fought and bled in Afghanistan uh, along our U.S. partners more than most. We have a uh, full battle group in Latvia now, part of the enhanced uh, forward posture. We've committed to a, a brigade, which is uh, coming up in 2025. We have uh, over 3,000 troops on high alert in Canada, ready to deploy to any uh, NATO mission. And we've actually increased our uh, spending by 70% over the next 10 years. That's what the government committed on. So, although we are not reaching the 2%. There's no intent, really, for this government to uh, to reach the 2%. The capabilities that we bring to, uh, to NATO are unique, and uh, they're valued by our allies. You know, it's, it's easy to, to look at Canada's defense budget, which is roughly 24 billion US dollars, and say, well, it's not a lot. But when you think that the entire NATO budget is about 1.2 trillion, and two thirds of that is U.S. money. Um, you know, it's there. No NHL team that pays their their players that disproportionately, right? It's not Tom Brady in his football career. So when you take the U.S. out, then you know Canada is actually uh, pretty much above average and uh, actually the sixth biggest spender. Most importantly, the um, the capabilities they bring. 
regardless of the amount spent, are valued and every mission that NATO is going into with Canada is a better mission than uh, without it, obviously. So, so I think in conclusion, the idea with NATO is not to necessarily spend more, it's just to spend better. We can in- invest more in diplomacy, in uh, disarmament, in multinational organizations. Uh, I think we're, we're proving now that with our modest contribution to the, the effort in Ukraine, we're making a difference. And uh, so this is why I strongly believe that Canada is a meaningful partner in NATO and that we're, we're there to stay. And uh, despite all the criticism, I think our current spendings are, are there by design and not by default. Great. Thank you, Eric. Well, uh, as we move across the northern tier of NATO, we cross the Atlantic and we go to the other Arctic member of the alliance, uh, and that would be Norway. And so, Steinar Dahl, please. Thank you, Ron. And being a small, smaller nation, but also a founding member, I'll agree with everything Eric said. And uh, being a small nation, we have a alliances are important to us. That is the best way for us to secure our way of scaling security, being a small but up to now a very strategic NATO member, being the forefront or the northern flank of NATO until Finland joined and later on Sweden. So I view my being an Arctic state and neighbor to Russia, I took my two Eisenhower speeches and looked at, one, how climate change is driving conflict and becoming increasingly a threat multiplier to conflict. And the second one, being a neighbor to Russia, how would a diminished Russia and an expanded and stronger NATO look like in the future? And being the topic on the NATO, I will focus on that. So Putin's sort of strategic gamble has turned into a strategic fumble. I think there is agreement that the last year of his Russia-Ukraine war has not been a very successful one for Russia. And however, we have seen historic decisions made in NATO And Finland and Sweden joining NATO will change the strategic landscape for Russia and for NATO and for Norway as well. So I looked at this, uh, the consequences of this new reverse dynamic and what long lasting implications will this have on the transatlantic security environment? How do you see a diminished Russia facing off against a stronger NATO? And I do think that it's likely that Putin will not concede in the Ukraine. There is too much invested into this war of aggression. And Russia has been defined by a series of war of existential, existential wars. And we also know that Russia will rearm and refocus. So the Norwegian security environment or the Scandinavian Nordic security environment will be changing. And we will have a more volatile and probably a more assertive Russia in our backyard. The Arctic will become more important because the Northern Fleet is the one thing that guarantees Russia its second strike nuclear capability. So the bases in the Kola Peninsula will become increasingly important because of the lack of success in Ukraine. And that sort of will impede and focus on our security. And of course, like I said, the fact that Finland and Sweden is joining NATO creates historic opportunities, both for defense cooperation on in the Scandinavian Peninsula, but also that with Finland, Russia now has a NATO land border from the Black Sea to the Barents Sea, which is, if you look at the new strategic concept of having more of a forward presence and is going from a strat- deterrence by punishment to a deterrence by denial, will have hugely important significance. But that will also create challenges, probably for NATO downrange, as you alluded to in your introduction, that NATO is unified at the moment, but NATO also has a history of being diverse on which problem set to focus on and where should the priorities lie within NATO. But I do think sort of my key conclusions when it comes to NATO is that Wars are fought for a better peace, and to me that is what the Russia-Ukrainian war is about. So what kind of political order is the West, and the West being NATO in this incident, interesting? What can we accept? What kind of Russia can we accept moving forward during this conflict, but also when we have a solution to the conflict? A large nuclear power, we will have a generational shift of power within Russia in the next 10 to 15 years. 
So are we looking at stability with concessions or volatility with restrictions? I think that's a big political, mostly debate to have. And how can we responsibly re-engage with Russia? I don't think anyone wants Russia to turn into a sort of a North Korean regime that is isolated, given the fact that it has a lot of energy and it has a lot of nuclear power that we need to be. So we need to compete on the vital interest and we need to co cooperate on the shared concerns. And I do think that the current political climate makes it very hard to re-engage with Russia in a responsible manner. Uh, basically, since the war is tied so heavily to the Putin regime, have it made it difficult. And I also think that the West needs to have a balanced view. We should learn that Ukraine's heroic war efforts do not automatically transition into heroic reconstruction efforts. So we need to have like a balanced view, relentless in you know, support of the Ukraine, but we also need to be a part of their reconstruction and helping them setting up that post-war order. And we also need to be mindful of the Russian desperation that likely will continue to increase moving forward. So in conclusion, I don't think there is there is any easy political solution. There will have, history tells us that it has to be a political solution to the Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, but it has to be on Ukraine's terms and not Russia's terms. And I do think that NATO as, a, as an alliance together with the European Union will play a pivotal role in reshaping that future security European environment. I, I thank you very much, Steinar, and thanks both of you for your for your perspectives on this. I mean, this this larger question of uh, the role that the alliance as an alliance should play. I think that you know at the Army War College, right, we talk a lot about allies and partners, and we have this living example of NATO. So I have I have a couple of questions uh, that I wanted to get your responses to, and the the first one is Eric, you you referenced. Uh, French President Macron's brain dead comments from 2019. And not only is he not the first person to say that NATO was uh, had lost its way, he's not the first French president to say something terrible about NATO. That, In fact, that seems to be part of the job description in the Elysee. But for both of you, before the coming of the war in Ukraine, what was your sense um, within your military and within your uh, uh, native, let's say, uh, political cultures about the role of NATO. Was there a sense that NATO had a clear purpose? Um, uh, was there a sense that NATO needed to make any major changes before the um, the war in Ukraine? I'll start with you, Eric, and then I'll go to you, Steiner. <clears throat> so um, let's go back to uh, the collapse of USSR. Hmm. Uh, NATO was no longer facing a, a, an adversary coalition, and it could have been the end of NATO at that point, right? right. Um, in 2002, I don't know if you remember this, but we had the Russia-NATO Council, where yeah. Russia was actually invited to, to NATO uh, meetings, and... <clears throat> It was kind of a soft agreement that NATO was not to expand into the sphere of influence of Russia. But if if you uh, use a little bit of strategic empathy, which is something we've learned at the War College, and you you put yourselves in Putin's shoes, well, well, what he's seen is the NATO border coming closer, closer, closer to his own border. He's seen former Soviet republics join NATO, so. Um, so for from his standpoint, there is a, a level of provocation that that you know most Westerners don't buy. But I mean, you, I I can understand his reasoning. So going back to the relevance of the alliance, I think NATO has been very agile, despite the fact that most this well, all decisions are have to be taken unanimously to kind of get out of Europe and look at different things they can do to bring a better world peace. Think about capacity building, for example. It was not a thing in the 80s uh, where, you know, we're all stacked up in, in Germany ready to fight Russia. But in, in the past two decades, I think this is something we really developed within NATO. And the fact that we all operate with common operating procedures and we can share equipment, we can, we can communicate, we can share data, we can share intelligence. Those are all things that remain 
so relevant and very useful when you try to build capacity in another country. And as you know, starting in 2015, when we started the capacity building mission in Ukraine, we developed in that army a very strong NCO core, uh, the ability to improve their tactical sustainment, their mechanized skills. We created uh, capabilities they didn't have before, like counter explosive experts. All of these things changed Ukraine. And I think this is why. Putin might have been surprised because he faced a very different army than the one he saw when he just rolled over Crimea in 2014. Right. This is the kind of thing that NATO can do now, right? Mm -hmm. And the enhanced forward presence in Europe is one thing, but I think capability building has proven its value. And I think that's the way forward for NATO. I like that. Thank you, Eric. Steinar, what's your sense of the alliance's past, present, future? Well, I think the fact that Finland and Sweden has sort of abandoned their decades of principles of neutrality really speaks to the perceived value of NATO as an alliance. Mm -hmm. Since uh, Norway and Iceland, we went with NATO back in the founding days, and Sweden and Denmark solved the same security problem with a completely different solutions for different purposes. And at, so having worked closely with the Finns for the last five years, I do think that NATO as an alliance that has remained and sort of gone through a series of generational shifts in terms of problems also speaks value to the alliance's ability to grow. Mm -hmm. And like you alluded to, being a part of a democracy is that we debate, we discuss, we are not always in alignment, but we debate and we discuss and we let the majority decide what direction. So even when NATO had from 2010, from the Madrid, when you sort of have the migration issue and being in Norwegian, we always have never lost focus on that the northern flank in Russia sort of nuclear capability is the main threat. NATO still perceived and was able to solve both missions. And I do think that the new strategic concept, the reorganization of NATO and making it more of a regional focus speaks value to the alliance's ability to grow and develop in concert with the security environment at the time. And what NATO did in Iraq and as, especially in Afghanistan speaks volume to the flexibility of the organization that basically was developed to sort of maintain peace and order at the European continent. And with Kosovo, the violence and the recent violence in Kosovo, I think NATO is as relevant as it were in its founding during the height of the Cold War. We now see a different need for NATO, but still the European nations and the transatlantic environment needs NATO as a cohesive framework to develop shared security. Right. I, and, and that's what I was I was thinking about listening to both of you, especially on the question of, of expansion, right, is that when NATO expansion is viewed from the perspective of the Russians, as Eric said, right, it can seem to be a sort of uh, centrally run uh, encroachment. But the role of the individual member states, the role especially of smaller states who have their own national interest and can choose, as Poland has, as Sweden and Finland most recently have, can choose to join the alliance, right? That that gives the alliance a special character, right? That it is, it is not uh, you know, the United States is the largest power in the alliance. But as you all know from your experiences, right, that doesn't mean that the United States gives orders to uh, to other NATO member states, um, and so I, um, so this gets to my second big question, and that is: both of you have studied in the United States. Uh, both of you obviously have have interacted with American units within NATO in your overseas deployments. Um, how does interoperability and cooperation work in the alliance for an officer in the in the Norwegian Army, Steiner? Like, how what has been your experience in working with Americans? Well, I think it's uh, it has increased that it's seamless. Uh, the Norwegian Armed Forces and the Army, well, all three services have had extensive NATO bilateral and NATO cooperation across. And we do it because once we are to operate together, we need to be in interoperable. So, for instance, mm -hmm. the command language in the Norwegian Armed Forces is English. It's not Norwegian. 
So that by issuing commands at the tactic formation in English, you are interoperable if you are attached to a Canadian unit or you're working with a US unit or you're working with a Polish or a German unit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I think speaks to the value of having shared opera. The diff if you look at the differences in equipment, cultural values and personalities that you can take five or seven NATO nations together and the amount of time that those respective formation needs sort of to get mission ready is astonishing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you look at the differences between. So we highly value in interoperability and we look for integration with our allies and partners whenever we can and whenever we can. So that's why the first exercise in Finland has always had Norwegian participation. So we have worked extensively with our Nordic partners on NATO standards for the last five years, mm -hmm. just to make sure that when, when the fight comes, we are able and willing to operate together. Interesting. And so NATO provided a framework that you could use to prepare for this cooperation or the, the NATO habits of habits of behavior within NATO pr helped provide a framework for that with the Finns. Yeah, the Finns. I mean, you use the, you use the agree on the same standards. And I mm -hmm. think that NATO standards are good and it allows more flexibility and then if you all were to use US standard because then are, there are some nations that will not use US standards but they would be more than happy to use NATO standards. Right, sure. So, uh, so that provides flexibility and I think uh, in interoperability requires that you have procedures and standards that are in alignment and I think NATO as a defense alliance is the best tool or vector for achieving that interoperability. Right. Well, and Eric, when we talk about close relationships, uh, people joke about the United States and Great Britain, that the special relationship, two peoples separated by a common language. Um, I don't know what uh, what a, a snarky comment I'd come up with to describe the sibling relationship between the United States and Canada, but let's just say we know each other very well. But what's it like to be a Canadian officer uh, within NATO, dealing with the United States, dealing with these questions of interoperability. Yeah, so um, <laughs> Pierre Elliott uh, Trudeau, the, the father of our current prime minister, said in the 80s that uh, the relationship between Canada and the U.S. is like uh, a mouse that sleeps next to an, an elephant. <laughs> the elephant could be like super nice, but when it moves, the mouse will, will kind of feel it, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, coming back to what Steiner said about interoperability being, the, uh, that's the name of the game, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, common operating language is also very important. Uh, I think it, we've discussed about this. So my squadron in Afghanistan operated only in French on the radio. Uh, and we were operating in uh, in an area that was under U.S. control. It was a U.S. company. So the company commander, the U.S. company commander, had this poor PFC <laughs> sit down all day listening to French radio <laughs> and I, in case at one point I would say, hey, Doug Company, I need to talk to you. And then this poor guy, I don't know, he's probably still bleeding from his ears from, from that tour. But <laughs> I, I mean, it, we made it work. Uh, the language, it, you know, we always adapt. Most of the senior people uh, in in the Canadian Army are bilingual, sure. uh, but uh, like just like Stainar, at the very tactical level, we work in our own language. I mm -hmm. think that the, the challenge will be because the U.S. invests so much in modernization and technology. If you outpace your allies, then you make some minor allies become irrelevant. And I'll give you a few good examples. So I sent uh, one of my battalions to GRTC, the, the Joint Training uh, Center in Fort Polk. Mm -hmm. the, our guns could not talk to American guns because we were still analog and uh, the American guns were fully digitalized. Uh. Same thing for some of the communication suites where, you know, if the U.S. comm suite is so advanced that we can't keep up, then we can talk to each other. It's not like back in the 80s where everybody was just on VHF, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> a very potent solution that the U.S. has found is the SFABs. Forgive me for not remember with remembering what the acronym stands for. Uh, Security Forces Assistance Brigade seems right. That sounds right to me too. And uh, 
So they had a small team that was attached to my Canadian battalion that allowed us to direct fire, uh, direct aviation assets, you know, get resupplied and get the full suite of integration by having only a few teams. As I want to say, they're fewer than five or ten people. Mm. They're attached to the, the a full uh, Canadian battalion, and they enabled that interop- interoperability. Those forces were designed to help, like partner nations, not necessarily allies. But I think uh, it was very agile from the U.S. Army to use this asset to uh, enable interoperability with, within NATO. And I mm-hmm. think it's been working very well because we have the tactics, the procedures. We, can, we understand each other's orders and this and that. The, but the pace of technology has to be steady. And again, to avoid outpacing your allies, I think the U.S. needs to keep finding these new solutions, innovative solutions to make sure that they don't leave anybody behind. Excellent point. Steinar, you wanted to add something to that? Yeah, I also think that like part, allies and partners can also challenge each other. So mm-hmm. whenever we do something, we always try to invite U.S. Army or Europe, more for Europe or the TUMF that we have extension relationship with. And by operating together, finding those friction points, seeking integration and sort of sharing it, but we can actually grow. So I think th- at least from my experience, we have been able to learn a lot from US Army Europe and second math. Mm-hmm. But we have also been able to contribute a lot because in a small army, you focus on quality over quantity. Mm-hmm. So lethality mm-hmm. is always at the forefront. So I do think that uh, like Eric's, like having those small teams and being willing and able to invest in each other on more than technology also speaks volume to pushing the alliance forward as a one cohesive organism of allies and partners. Right. Well, and, you know, sadly, we are we are approaching the end of this conversation. But Sinar, since you mentioned going forward, I want to ask you both a final question on the future. And that is, what does NATO's world role look like after the war in Ukraine? Assuming that the war does, as Steinar says, right, eventually it will end. Um, eventually, NATO will have to figure out how to deal with Russia. But there's also lurking in the background the question of where does NATO fit within the American perspective on China as the pacing threat of the future? Um, how does this look from the perspective of of your national uh NATO contribution. I, and I say this, of course, and I'll give you all the out, right, that I don't expect you two to be speaking on behalf of the official position of your governments. Uh, but uh, but I'd like to know how it, how it feels from a NATO partner perspective to think about the future relationship within the alliance uh, and, the, uh, as a, and its global role. So, Eric, I'm going to go to you first. So uh, I'm going to give you a war college answer, Ron. It depends. <laughs> All right. You get the, a gold uh, star, Colonel. All right. There we go. Thank Moving you. Forward. <laughs> the, uh, like how the war ends in Ukraine uh, will, I think, dictate how NATO reacts to the aftermath. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my personal preference would be to resume the capability building mission uh, in Ukraine because you know a, a lot of Canadians are very proud of what they've done in Ukraine between 2015 and 2021, mm-hmm. and uh, I think we did uh, a lot of great things in that country for that country and enabling them to be a partner of choice uh, even if they remain outside of NATO. So, <clears throat> but again, it depends on the terms of, of the end of the war. And one of the costs of a peaceful ending to this war might be there will be no NATO missions in Ukraine anymore, right? So it, it really, it, I think it really depends. Uh, but like I said, I think we what we've done, what NATO has done in Ukraine is is stellar about capacity building. And that's that's the way of the future, I think. If if you look at the the, the Pacific, I think... We have to use the interoperability that was created by NATO to uh, kind of expand. I don't think we're, we're going we're looking at the NATO of the Pacific, but mm-hmm. I can tell you that Canada just recently pu- published its uh, new strategy for the Pacific, and I it will involve capacity building in the Pacific. Why not use the lessons learned from NATO? and what we've contributed in Europe 
you know, anywhere in the world. I think that's mm-hmm. that's probably NATO's role in a peaceful for world is you don't need to expand to have a partnership for peace and any like-minded partners. I think maybe what we'll see in the Pacific are not NATO members, but but certain uh, certainly NATO partners that can operate with NATO navies and NATO uh, uh, air forces and armies. I think that in the next decade, that would be very realistic, Ron. Yeah, good. Thank you, Eric. Steiner, how about you? What does it look like from from the high north? Well, I think uh, NATO's new concept and it's sort of refocus on its three core tasks is a, at least for me, a pivotal moment of sort of reshaping the alliance back into what the alliance always has been. So I think NATO will and should remain a defensive alliance. Mm-hmm. And we will see a closer cooperation with the European Union. And I, NATO has to decide on its political role. So mm-hmm. how political as an alliance or how much political power should NATO expand at the expense of the European Union or its larger regional powers? But I do think NATO focused on its core tasks. And I fully agree with Eric, starting a rebuilding mission in Ukraine, partners for peace, being a center of excellence that can expand sort of its model to the Pacific. And... And I also think NATO has a lot of potential in the technology, like we just talked, that we need to get fewer platforms that will allow for greater savings across and more integrated services in order to, if the world is going to be more murky going forward, we need to find ways and means where we can have a more shared re- defense across, especially within NATO, which is, has that that many years of existence, find cost solution that is cost effective. And we should not forget that integrating new members into alliance takes time. And I agree that like, expansion should not be the priority, but it should be to get the inner workings of the alliance as is to work better at a larger scale. And we also have to look at Ukraine and keep the standards. So if you're going to accept new members, we have to at least maintain the standards because there's a lot of ways that we can support potential membership states like Ukraine or Georgia going forward. But we also need to set a political order that is sustainable for the next. And I do think climate change will be a force that will also be something that NATO to an increasing degree will have to counter with. Right. And they're going uh, forward. And the, yeah, the world is going to be uh, extremely complicated. However, the war in Ukraine ends. It's been interesting how the war itself has let's say, pulled NATO together and encouraged a focus on cooperation. Uh, It's been an interesting year to be students at the War College, I'm sure, for both of you. I know that the War College has been enriched by your presence here, as with all of our uh, allies and partners. And I want to thank uh, Eric Landry and Steinar Dahl for coming here on A Better Peace to talk about your experiences and your uh, expertise in NATO. Good luck on your assignments uh, beyond commencement here at the uh, War College, which is rapidly approaching. Thanks for being here, guys. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. That's great. That's great. And thanks to all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and all the programs. Send us your suggestions for future programs. Please uh, consider becoming an ally and partner of A Better Peace as uh, we have allies and partners in NATO by choosing to subscribe to A Better Peace on your podcatcher of choice. And after you have like a good ally and partner, subscribe to A Better Peace. Please do your 2% part by rating and reviewing this podcast so that other people can find out about us because that's how we can continue to expand this community. Uh, We are always looking to expand this particular community, whatever one might think about NATO. And we look forward to welcoming as many people as possible to future conversations like this one. And even though this conversation is over, we look forward to welcoming you next time. And so until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.com.
www.armywarcollege.edu and have a great day.